Hey everyone, thank you so much for uh, watching. This is Janine from Lupus Life Hacks, and we are going to dive right in with our special guest, Dr. Mitchell. He is a naturopathic doctor practicing in Gilbert, Arizona, and he's the founder of AZ Integrative Rheumatology, where he specializes with, with people with lupus, RA, and other autoimmune diseases. Nailed it. Dr. Mitchell. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about lupus um, and about how the integrative medicine, the integrative therapy route is a little bit different and more patient focused and patient centered. And I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks, Janine. It was a pleasure and I'm, I'm honored to be here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Absolutely. <music> What we're doing is super, like to what you were saying, um, it's so needed in our community and not even just with lupus, the lupus community, but with chronic illness in general, uh, we've, we've forgotten how to, how to, I don't even know, how to treat it, how to look at it and just how to take care of people again and even how to take care of ourselves. I think we've forgotten how to do that. And so by, you know, if, but with us working together, I think that we can bring it back to the basics and remind people like what we're capable of internally so that we would, you know, if we come to see you in the office, then we'll be able to communicate what's hurting, how it's hurting and what we can do together to make, to make, you know, manage our symptoms better. And with doctors like you, I think it, it's more feasible as compared to doctors who've been in the field for so long that they're stuck in their old ways and old bad habits. Mm hmm yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, as, as an added component to that is, is just giving these patients a glimpse of, you know, the experiences of others who have dealt with this sort of thing. Because I think a lot of patients can really feel alone in their struggle, you know, mm -hmm. which is really surprising because we live in a world where we're more connected than ever, you know, and, and at times it can be really tough for family and friends to understand what, what the uh, chronic illness sufferer is going through. I totally agree. I, I'm, I'm actually a, a naturopathic physician. Er, I'm licensed. That's, right. that's okay. No, the, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of confusion across uh, different brands of practitioner, but I mean, you can lump me in the functional sphere. Uh, because I do a lot of the, the same things that functional medicine providers do. But I'm a naturopathic physician, um, just in a nutshell, trained as a primary care provider. And so uh, about 10 years of school for that naturopathic medical training. And uh, yeah, so my interest in rheumatology, I, I was really interested in weird stuff. And so <laughs> rheumatology is where strange... Uh, difficult to diagnose things occur. And so just a really short story. One of my first cases in the clinic was a case of visual snow. So basically girl traveled to Myanmar and Thailand and um, got a really bad bout of gastroenteritis and flew it out of both ends, fevers, nausea, and came back to the States and her symptoms abated, her GI symptoms, but at work one day, she had the onset of uh, some kind of visual abnormality, and she could see like TV static in her visual field. That that was how she described it to me at the time. And so, uh, prior to actually seeing her, I had jumped into the literature to see what this was, and uh, I found an article on something called visual snow and visual snow syndrome. And so, I printed out the article, went through it, and there's a visual representation of what the patients see. And it basically is like static on an old TV screen. And so uh, when I got to meet with her in the room with the other student who was the primary, she saw my review article and she was like, I printed that out. And on the second page, this is what I have. And I was like, really, this is this is so cool because not for her, obviously, but probably one of the very I probably won't ever see another case of visual snow in in my life, you know, and career as a physician. But 
Um, that was on a, a shift where the nature path was focused on rheumatology and we saw more and more patients with, you know, the, these very vague, unspecific symptoms, soreness, joint pain, swelling, sun sensitivity, rashes, hair loss, so on and so forth. And I just kind of fell in love with working with these kinds of patients and, you know, it, a lot more interesting than just treating diabetes and being overweight and thyroid and so on. So um, that's me in a nutshell. That's so interesting um, how you almost, like, you, you fell into it, basically, your passion, and this luckily came along. Um, that's a really cool story, and I'm glad that you got to experience something like that. Um, so, f basically, your curiosity is what keeps you going. Yeah, and I think as a physician, you know, that that's why people get into medicine, because they're just curious, and then you have the component where you know, you like physiology and nutrition and the way, you know, the workings of the body. It's like an auto mechanic, you know, we're just auto mechanics of the body. And I should add, you know, there was a little bit of my own health struggles in leading me down this direction. And so uh, my parents were great, but weren't really diligent about healthcare. And so I, uh, I had some very vague conditions that smacked of connective tissue disease, um, really bad ray nods when I was young. Uh -huh. um, cold hands and feet, rashes, uh, GI issues, probably irritable bowel syndrome, chronic anemia. And the biggest thing, which, you know, I, I still struggle to have a handle on at times currently is, is, is mood and, and definitely lifestyle plays a role there. And so maybe something auto-inflammatory or autoimmune going on in myself, I've never had it worked up and I don't really see a reason to because it's not going to change what I need to do to uh, make sure my health is where it needs to be. Yeah, it is piggybacking off the lifestyle. I think it makes a huge difference in mm -hmm. how well you can manage disease. And a lot of times rheumatologists forget that um, because they're so ready to, you know, get the worst symptom because they do. They want to help the patient manage, you know, the horrible joint pain that keeps them in bed every day. Um, but it's it's nice to come back again to that root and work on diet and work on stretching even if you're in pain sometimes like i know excuse me if i'm stretching even though i'm in pain it's going to help me three days later like mm -hmm. it's, it's consistency and consistency in that lifestyle and that and it does help with your mental health too and, and definitely in the mood i mean there's a whole gut brain connection that we could probably go into detail about but we won't yeah <laughs> That's all really important too, but I, I just want to uh, second something you said there just about rheumatology. And, and so I, uh, as a, I am a naturopathic provider, but I'm, I'm situated in a setting with a rheumatologist and we have this really integrative model and and I never really uh, poo poo so much on, on what they do and just focusing on the most urgent thing because if you know anything about the history of rheumatology, you know that the reason we don't have these really adverse outcomes as frequently as we used to is because of uh, the way pharmacology has gone and the treatments we have today. And uh, I, I can side with patients and not wanting to uh, rest everything on just that, you know, and there's so much we can do addressing the gut and the brain and the diet and sleep quality and movement and so on. But we can't help you with that stuff if, you know, your disease tears your kidneys apart, you know, or, right. or destroys your joints and so on. And so, yeah, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're preventing those complications. Yeah, ab oh, absolutely. It's definitely an integrative approach. You have to do both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the yep. best way for it. And especially, like you said, if there's organ involvement, you're we're way past that lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Yeah, let's talk about patient-doctor communication. Um, I guess the biggest thing that helps me is when uh, these patients aren't stoic, okay? And, and really, uh, I like it when patients talk to me. And, and I understand why some of them are that way because they've just been sort of beat down by the medical establishment. And if, if, it, if, if, you've, if a patient has gone through the unfortunate journey of uh, having more of a vague presentation to their condition, it can't be nailed down very easily because 
they don't appear as sick as some emergent patients and mm -hmm. things aren't as obvious, then, you know, they can just kind of get bumped around from clinician to clinician and feel like nobody's listening and that people are making them feel like they're crazy. But uh, I just had a woman like this the other day who was labeled with the ICD-10 code somatoform disorder, which is essentially the clinician thinks that they're crazy and this is totally a psychosomatic thing. But um, really, it, it's helpful to just be um, as open with your clinician as possible because one of the things that we do in integrative medicine, uh, naturopathic and functional medicine is really, really dive into uh, the history and try to find out if there's any uh, precipitating factors uh, that were really obvious so that it, it can direct us in the right way towards the tools we need to use to help address things at the deepest level. I mean, it, I, I do want to know about, you know, your rashes and how severe your joint pain is and the hair loss and the GI stuff and so on and so forth. But um, really, uh, just just being as open as possible and, and helping me get insight as to what's going on. So something beforehand as an example, would that be like childhood history, how they grew up in terms of like what they ate, who, you know, emotional trauma, things like that? So that's a great example of emotional trauma. And, and I don't expect somebody to come in and start gushing to me about all of that stuff right off the bat because that it's a very sensitive topic and, yeah. you know, they see me and I'm a terribly intimidating looking and threatening looking guy, right? But uh, no, I, I can completely understand, you know, not wanting to talk about those sorts of sensitive issues right away, but um, those are relevant. And you, you may have seen something that I posted on Instagram uh, last week or before that, but uh, we definitely have evidence incriminating um, past traumatic events um, to the initiation of autoimmune disease. And um, I, I, I fall in the I fall in the camp where, you know, believing that it's something that actually can perpetuate the auto-inflammatory process as well. I 100% agree. So thinking of, I had a really good question on that. So and I lost it. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> so when we're talking about emotional trauma, um, is there something, you know, is there maybe a short version on how you want somebody to communicate or do you maybe should they fill out like a questionnaire so they're not actually talking to you about it but maybe they'll check off like yes emotional trauma or you know sp something specific yeah just, so just to kind of make it more comfortable yeah um usually it's just rapport that's established over time with with repeated yeah. visits you know i don't try to rush them into that i'll just kind of look at that and take notice if it's on the intake form or not and, you know, I'm, I'm okay with saying sometimes I'm not the right guy for them to, I'm not the right clinician for them to talk to about this. And maybe they're more comfortable in a setting with, with a counselor or mm -hmm. a different nature path or somebody else who can, uh, who they might be, who they might feel more comfortable or open uh, discussing these things with. Um, but I, I uh, usually just try to tag you know, what's on their mind, what they're feeling uh, about what may have happened and, you know, more more so in the present rather than kind of digging up old wounds. Okay. And there's a, there's a form of medicine that I use um, that's, that's uh, very gentle and safe and in trying to address some of those issues at, at a deeper level with without actually learning terribly a lot about it. Um, but definitely that that talking component can be helpful. And actually on that topic, so I've, I've heard from a lot of um, patients who where doctors would say, you, you know, lupus is triggered by emotional trauma being in the past and patients actually get really offended and they shut down and they don't, they end up not even trusting their doctors after that. So what we're trying to clarify sometimes is that we're not saying it's the only thing that triggered it, but it's it's one of the triggers because it's a stressor on your body and it, it physically manifests in that way when you're holding on to something so deep. And so I just want to clarify that for anyone watching. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Um, it, it, we're not uh, trying to incriminate you for anything or, or suggest that yeah. it's the only thing going on because 
autoimmune disease obviously is multifactorial, but it's an important piece of the puzzle that needs to be considered. Absolutely. Um, and I'm really happy we talked about this because it's something that a lot of people don't want to talk about. <laughs> it's, so something it's, really that, it's something that it's something that you know is is still difficult for me to talk about sometimes, and it, it's very uncomfortable. And it's just kind of a product of our our social construct, but you know, mm -hmm. and being vulnerable and things like that. But if you want to get a handle on your health, it's it's something to be considered. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Yep. Um, so then, what else would help communicate? When, let's say we're communicating um, that we're in pain or we're tired all the time. How can we best relate it to someone who doesn't have lupus? <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> I, for, so I got to say, I will, I will never have an appreciation for what my patients are going through because I'm not in their shoes. Um, but but real, so one of, one of the things that I use um, in clinical practice and hopefully your rheumatologist or whoever else your provider is, is doing something like this as well is uh, having you fill out some kind of um, metric for your uh, fill out some form that metrics your disease activity and so one I like to use is called the um, the um, health assessment questionnaire the hack I use or a rapid three and so it just asks really basic questions about um, you know your your functional status can you climb stairs can you comb your hair can you get out of a chair um, uh, chairs, hairs, and stair, stairs were on my mind because I just had a polymyositis patient the other day, and so that's one of the things that we check for. But really, your clinician should be doing a lot more uh, than just coming in and saying, how you doing? Are you better the same or worse? You know, and so it kind of gives us some objectivity as to how you're, how you're doing and how, how whatever intervention you're using is, is uh, making a difference. And if they're not doing what you suggested, is that a t is that like an indication where maybe we should see a different doctor within that practice, or maybe we should be seeing more doctors? Because I, I mean, from personal experience, I don't have that actually. Yeah, the so yeah, I would say if if you, I would say if you don't have a doctor who's being diligent about that, you know, you might offer it up just because you know say, hey, um, I think this would really help uh, track what we're, my response to what we're doing better. And, uh, you know, if, if they're open to it, then great. If they kind of scoff and say, no, I'm not going to change up what I'm doing, then, and, you know, really it's, it's something that is kind of standard in practice and really only yeah. the older rheumatologists, these older dogs are the ones who are just kind of gestalt and how you doing. And so, yeah. uh, but the other thing you can do on your own too, I don't think you need to necessarily uh, abandon, you know, sort of the older approach and, and these more stubborn clinicians. If they're a great practitioner and they've helped you out a lot is just keeping mm -hmm. a, a, a diary of your symptoms, you know, and tracking those one to 10, one worse, 10 best on a daily basis to see how you're doing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, it definitely consistency is key as always. So mm -hmm. always write it down, even if that includes your mood, because your mood could make your pain worse. Mm -hmm. um, writing down your mood, what you ate, how you feel before and after. Those are mm -hmm. really important tips and they will help your doctor so much. Yeah, I, I like to I like to put the burden a little bit more on on the uh, doctor in doing this, because I know day to day metrics at home can drive some people crazy and so there's there's some individualization that that needs to be done here and i don't have the answer as to how the best what the best way in terms of an individualization yeah. is but i would just simply say that you know if you find ruminating on your functional status and how you're doing day to day is is driving you insane and emotionally which can be a driver for uh not feeling well then yeah just don't do it and maybe try to get the onus put on your provider yeah i totally agree thank you for um adding to that helps you what helps you help patients or yeah so another thing that helps me help patients is staying on top of their uh, medications and coming in with a medication list because uh, mm -hmm. as you know patients with rheumatologic disease are are um, unfortunately um, um, going through polypharmacy and they're on a lot of different drugs and so it's helpful for uh, the 
clinician to have a list of, of what you're currently taking, not only medications, but supplements. So people will come in and, you know, they've got a cabinet full of 20, 30 things and, you know, they don't have a sense of what they're taking with regularity and, and you know, what's just kind of being taken intermittently. So really sorting that out. It's very important because um, I know, especially with supplements, people are always changing them up too, and mm -hmm. you never know what's going to interact or hurt your kidneys long term. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of variables that I think we forget about when we're trying to support ourselves naturally. Absolutely. The integrative approach, what that means, and what that looks like. Yeah, so essentially uh, people will come into the practice, they get diagnosed by the rheumatologist, or if the case isn't too daunting, you know, I'll try to take it on myself. But basically it's it's just the joining of uh, the best of conventional with the best of functional or naturopathic medicine. And so you've got somebody who's an expert in the, uh, the diagnostic process, uh, tracking the disease metrics, and uh, managing the medications, and then you have somebody else who uh, knows what, where to investigate for the deep um, and underlying root causes and is well-versed in nutrition and lifestyle and everything connected to that and, and uh, natural remedies and supplements and things like that. And so they'll come in, they'll get worked up by the rheumatologist, you know, that's that's usually a, a couple week period. And uh, if, if the patient, you know, is is game, they're usually started on, on conservative treatments. So like if we had an RA patient come in, they might get their, their, uh, their blood counts and their inflammatory markers and their rheumatoid factors and their CCPs and their x-rays of their joints to have baseline evaluation. Um, of any damage that's been done and then you know these metrics that we talked about the rheumatologist here likes to use a DOS 28 um, just to give us some objectivity and then they'll be passed off to me for uh, nutritional management and if the resources are available doing this deeper investigation looking for uh, we, we talked about emotional trauma and uh, we talked about you mentioned the the gut brain access so uh, testing for dysbiosis you know overgrowth of bacteria in the digestive tract hormone status uh, micronutrient status and then you know i like to do an advanced cardiovascular screen in these patients because yeah. they tend to be at higher risk for cardiovascular disease that's really um proactive of you actually <laughs> yeah well there's there's a saying uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure, right? And so, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to heart disease, because if you have a adverse event, there's a pretty good chance that, uh, unfortunately, you'll be leaving us, and we don't want that. So we want to prevent that. Absolutely. Um, I love the approach, and I actually have a, a great question for you, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so out of the patients that you've had so far, um, what is commonly one of the triggers? Like, do you see a lot of people with um, gut dysbiosis issues or is it mostly something else or? Yeah. Um, I would say the highest yield is going to be the gastrointestinal tract. And so um, there's a lot of people say that the gut is kind of the, the center, the hub for total health. And um, what, I'm, what I've been finding out with my own experience and looking at a lot of the new research that's coming out is, is that the, um, the balance of, of the ecosystem in your digestive tract is, is a, um, really a, a central mediator in all of this. Uh, basically what I was saying more and more research is kind of incriminating dysbiosis and overgrowth of certain bacteria and microorganisms and uh, the perpetuation of the autoimmune process. So 
that's that's one of the places that uh, I'll look first. Uh, even if the history is convoluted, I, I definitely think it's it's def it's worth looking at. And then related to that, the other big needle mover really is the uh, nutritional aspect. And so uh, there's food sensitivity testing that that I sometimes do if the uh, patient isn't really privy to doing an aggressive elimination diet right off of the bat, but um, I've, I've found that a lot of patients have success with these different autoimmune protocols like um, autoimmune paleo. And so mm -hmm. my friend Rob Abbott and some of his friends, uh, Angie Alton, Mickey Trescott, have, have gotten some pilot studies published and hopefully that more research is on the way. Oh, wonderful. I would love to read those actually. Um, yeah, you should, you should reach out know. to you should reach out to Rob Abbott too, and maybe consider having him on here because he's he's uh, involved in the um, autoimmune research and working with these kinds of patients as well. Check it out. I love reading publications and different. You know, on a side note, I love reading all that stuff. So I'm really uh, intrigued by it. And, and anything, anything, any study that has to do with gut issues and emotional health, like all yeah. the triggers. It's so exciting. And going back to the gut issues, so there's a, a conventional newsletter I follow on something called MD Edge. So it just keeps conventional clinicians up to date. Um, there's a researcher, I'm not remembering his name right now, but he's on the East Coast. He's a rheumatologist, and um, his lab is working on looking at this digestive connection um, to lupus and other autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really cool to hear. Um, a rheumatologist used the term leaky gut in I, this. Uh, yeah, that's like a scary one. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was like, did did this MD rheumatologist just say leaky gut? Wow. <laughs> so, so it's uh, it's catching on, you know, and and the evidence based sphere will will eventually have treatments targeting that. I think, but um, as you know, and as you've done for yourself, and um, a lot of others have, have done really addressing the nutrition and taking care of this uh, leaky gut syndrome is really helpful. Absolutely. Leaky gut is definitely a number one factor. Um, and I appreciate you sharing more uh, that there's more research on it because that's super important. Um, that's something that we can bring to our other MDs who are unaware of it still. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be something as well. I really appreciate, on, on a side note though, I really do appreciate you taking the time out to do this. And um, and I thank you so much for giving us your insight because it's so valuable to hear something from your perspective. Cool. Well, I look forward to hearing the other perspective when, when we do the uh, podcast interview. So Yeah, absolutely. Maybe the podcast. I think that would be good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's an I, it's, it's just lupus links on iTunes, so that would be cool. Okay. Is it new? Yeah, it's the podcast isn't new, but the, the name change is new. So there's like 20 episodes, okay. but new direction. Cool. So That's exciting. Well, I'm glad I'm excited to be part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm stoked. So it'll be cool to have you on there. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. We'll have a good rest of your day. You too, all right? All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you.